Jordan's discipleship teacher, tells this on his podcast. One night a cab driver picked up a nun with one of the spares. After a few minutes, the cab driver started to make a conversation with her. He told the nun that they were rotten columns. The nun of them were Catholic and Saints. After a few more minutes, the cab driver says, uh, Sister, this may seem a little forward, but I've always wanted to kiss a nun. The nun doesn't seem taken aback by this. Saying that maybe it has something to do with a emotional event in childhood. She tells him that it would be okay if he wanted to kiss her. So the cab driver pulls over, gets in the back seat, and they kiss. The cab driver proceeds to get back in the front seat, continues to drive on. After a few minutes, the cab driver says, Sister, I need to make a confession. I'm not really Catholic. In fact, I'm, I, I'm not really religious at all. But he continues, I'm also not single, but I'm happily married. And the one says, well, that's okay. In fact, I need to make a confession to you as well. I'm not a Catholic either. In fact, I'm not even a nun. He continued, my name is Bruce, and I'm on the way to a Halloween party. <laughs> that would be a rude awakening, wouldn't it? These men were not men of principle. They weren't led by any fundamental truths at the foundation for their behavior. Whenever behavior is based on absence of principles, you will have major problems. They also were not men of scruples. They had no trouble lying in the scene. It didn't bother them in the least. So why do I tell this story? When I heard the story last week, you know, I was reminded of Joseph's brothers. They were also men without principle or scruples. They were jealous, envious, hateful, rageful, murdering, scheming liars. Joseph's brother Sidney had no consciousness. And this morning we're going to be in Genesis chapter 42. And we're going to see that God and Joseph is testing these brothers as part of God's plan. They need to be tested as they become the leaders of the tribes of Israel. They need to be tested to see if they have changed. Or if they are the same jealous, envying, murdering, stealing liars that they were when they sold Joseph, Joseph into slavery. They need to be tested to see if their consciousness could be awakened. And if their conscience could be awakened, would they remember their guilt and sin against Joseph and be led to repentance? These tests are going to be rude awakenings for the brothers. Because that's what they're going to need to be transformed. For us as Christians, God will also test us. And when the Holy Spirit speaks, convicting us of our sin, it is imperative that we listen. It's imperative that we be reminded of our unconfessed sin and be led to repentance. And that brings us to our big idea this morning that God tests his people remind them of their sin, and bring them to the As we think about our big idea this morning, let's ask God to open our hearts and minds of his scripture this morning. Let's our heads in the Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our hearts and minds for what we're going to hear this morning from your word. Pray that we would be attentive to your Holy Spirit, what he wants to say to us. Let us remember that your testing in our lives is good and is always for our benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first point this morning is commission. And we'll be in Genesis 42, like I said, and the first part is verses 1 to 6. We follow along as I read those verses and this is what God told so. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continues, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. But Jacob, <clears throat> excuse me, go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. The ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. 
But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others. Because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land. The person who sold all the grain to the people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. We need to go back to Genesis 41, 57 to find out what was happening in the beginning here of chapter 42. There's a severe famine and it's everywhere. All the world is going to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. First thing he notices, it's a worldwide famine, which would have been an uncommon occurrence. For famine to come to Egypt, it meant that there had been no rain in the south, so the Nile River was not able to overflow her banks. And for famine to come to Canaan, it meant that no rain had fallen on the land itself. You know, we've seen in the Bible already in Genesis, famine in Canaan a number of times. But we've never seen a famine in Egypt. <coughs> So I was curious, I looked it up on Wikipedia. In the last 2,500 years, there have only been 11 recorded famines in Egypt. For famine to occur in both Egypt and Canaan at the same time was a supernatural event sent by God who filled his plans and purposes. Jacob learns that there was grain in Egypt to be bought, so he commissions his sons to go down there and buy it. And he questions his sons about why they are why are they just looking at each other and not doing something about their lack and need of food. The same root word for learned and looking in verse one means idle in the Greek, and it suggests that the sons are being indecisive. His sons do not notice what is obvious, and that is contrasted with Joseph's insight in chapter forty-one whose plan was to save Egypt in the world for famine. For some reason, Jacob's sons did not come up with that same brilliant idea that Jacob had to go buy food so they could live and not die. Maybe it was because the trip to Egypt was 250 to 300 miles long. A round trip could take up to six weeks. You know, and it would have been a dangerous trip with bandits prowling and looking about. But I believe that God was bringing back memories of their sin against Joseph. You can imagine just the mention of Egypt probably brought up memories of what they did to him. These were memories they didn't want dredged up, but their lives were at stake. They needed food, and if they didn't get it, they and their families could die. God is testing them to see if their consciousness can be awakened, and if so, can they be moved to repentance. Because if their consciences can't be awakened, repentance can never happen. God was using the family to test the brothers. He was testing them with a lack or need of food. The brothers needed to obey their father and trust in God to provide. They also needed to trust God as he brought these memories to light. Of course, God used the family to drive the brothers to Egypt in order to meet Joseph face to face. So they can be tested further. You know, sometimes God will test us with the lack or need of something. He wants us to rely and trust on Him to provide our needs. You know, maybe it's a financial need. You know, right now, I have a friend who's getting married soon and looking for a full time job and a place to live. You know, a full time job is silly opening up, but it just hasn't happened yet. Time is short in their mind, and, but God wants them to trust him for his timing and provision. Maybe it's a relationship need. Maybe you're looking for that perfect someone that God has for you to spend your life with as a married couple. Sometimes God, sometimes God wants us to wait on him and his timing for that perfect someone. Maybe it's need for guidance or more direction. Maybe you feel God is calling you to a different job or career. 
the doors not opening for open, open up for you as you think they should. Again, God wants you to wait on him for the perfect time. That brings us to our first next step on the back of the communication part this morning. Which is the trust in the Lord to provide for me. In my times of lack or need. <clears throat> So the brothers obey their father, the patriarch of their family. And they go down to Egypt to buy grain. We notice that Jacob does not send Benjamin with them. Benjamin is identified here as Joseph's brother, not theirs, which continues the favorite status of Rachel's sons in Jacob's life. But he didn't send Benjamin because he was afraid that heart might come to him. This is really the first inkling we have that. Jacob was suspicious of his sons about what happened to Joseph. He's not about that, he's not about to let that happen to Benjamin. He may not know exactly what happened, but he knows his son's character. He's going to keep Benjamin close. Jacob probably mentioned this possible harm to Benjamin on their watch, and this would have also brought back memories of their sin against Joseph. We also notice that Jacob's, Jacob's sons are referred to as Israel's sons, informing the first hearers about how the nation of Israel came to be in Egypt in the first place. Stating that Joseph is the governor of the land is in, has, and is in charge of selling grain to all the people sets up this meeting between him and his brothers. When they arrive in Egypt, they bow down to him. This was the fulfillment of his first dream in chapter 37, which would have given him confidence that God has been in control of all that has happened to him. But how could it be possible that Joseph would just happen to be in the right place and at the right time to meet his brothers? Well, it's not possible to believe that Joseph would have been notified before he was to buy grain. No, he would have been tasked with making sure that Egypt wasn't overrun with spies. And of course, the main reason Joseph was there was because of the sovereignty of God. It was God's plan to draw the brothers to Egypt in order to come face to face with Joseph. That brings us to our second point this morning called Confrontation. And that's found in Genesis 42, verses 7 to 26. This is what God's word says. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you were spies. And this is how you were tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother, and the rest of you will be kept in prison, so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back from your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, that you may not die. 
This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. But they did not realize that Joseph could understand them, since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. But then he came back and spoke to them again. He had sinned and taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. So what we notice is that Joseph recognized his brothers immediately, who pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. He questioned them about where they were from. They said they came from Canaan to buy food. And then the text says his brothers didn't recognize Joseph, even though he recognized them. So we ask, how is that possible? Well, we need to remember that they haven't seen him in 20 years. And they think he's dead. Joseph also had been clean shaven, wearing Egyptian garments and the royal dress of being second in command. Realistically, the brothers are kind of physically blind when it comes to recognizing Joseph. And Matthew says the author is portraying the brothers as spiritually blind. Why did he just tell them right then there who he was? Well, because they need to be tested. This was God's plan for Joseph to test his brothers to see if their consciences could be awakened, reminding them of their sin and readying them to repent for what they had done to him. Again, these would be the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Were they now changed men, having godly principles and scruples? Were they going to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord and teach their families to do the same? God's testing would eventually answer these questions. So after this initial questioning, Joseph remembered the dreams that he had about them. If you remember when his first son was born, he named him Manasseh, which means forgotten. It seems that Joseph had forgotten his dreams and what his brothers had done to him. And to forget meant that he wasn't holding what they had done against them. God had brought Joseph to a place of forgiveness so that his dreams of what had happened to him did not consume him and make him bitter. Joseph, through God's help, was able to accomplish this. Joseph accused his brothers of spying in order to find out where Egypt's borders were vulnerable. The brothers denied his accusations and reiterated that they're just there to buy food. They volunteered personal information about themselves and their family, claiming that they are honest men. <coughs> now, the brothers probably think that a family of brothers dressed like foreigners would be the worst spies ever. And Joseph probably scoffed because of what he knew about his brothers was anything but honest. But we see the cleverness of Joseph as he accuses them a second time. This causes the brothers to divulge more personal information about themselves and their family. They admit that they once were a family of 12 brothers, all sons of one man who lives in Canaan. They added that their youngest brother is back home with their father, and one brother is no more, meaning that their brother is dead. Again, the mention of Joseph being no more would have reminded them of what they had done to him, awakening their consciences even more. This was a pretty, pretty honest account, to a point. Of course, they left out that the one brother was dead because of their actions. Joseph took notice of this information, and it gave him hope. It gave him cause for concern, and it gave him an idea. Joseph had hope because his father and full brother were still alive. Until now, he had no idea if that was true or not. 
It also gave him cause for concern because he didn't know if they had treated Benjamin as badly as they treated him. It also gave Joseph the idea of how they could prove their honesty. For a third time, he accuses them of being spies and tells them how they're going to be tested on this. He begins by making an oath on the life of Pharaoh. They would not be able to leave Egypt until their youngest brother was brought there. One of them must go home to bring that brother back, while the rest stay in prison. He was going to see if they had changed or not. Were they honest men as they claimed to be? If they were not telling the truth, then on the life of Pharaoh, they would be considered spies and punished as such. Joseph put them in prison, put them all in prison for three days. Again, he's testing them to see if they would turn on each other. And he's also testing them by reaping what they had sown. Do you remember back in chapter 37 when Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers? They accused him of being a spy. Now he's accusing them of being spies. Joseph was put in prison for a crime he didn't commit, and now they are put in prison. For a crime they didn't commit. They are being treated the same way that they treated Joseph in order to connect their circumstances with God's judgment. God was testing them to see if their conscience is going to be awakened. And this was the first step in knowing if they could be righteous men and trust with leading his chosen people. Next we notice that God tests them with kindness, showing them by Joseph. After three days in prison, Joseph seemingly changes his mind. He is now willing to let nine of the brothers go back to Canaan, requiring only one to remain in custody. And he shows this kind of because he fears God, meaning that he was honest, and they could trust him to keep their word. This statement of honesty by Joseph would remind them that they weren't always honest men, and even though, even though they were portraying themselves as such. Again, awakening their conscience to what they had done. This kindness would allow the brothers to take the ten sacks of grain back to their starving family in Canaan. It would also be safer as they traveled the three-week journey home. If they brought their youngest brother back to Egypt, they would pass the test and prove that they were honest men like they said. There was still a sense of death hanging over their heads, but if they proved to be honest men, they would not die, but they would live. So they proceeded to carry out his orders. The results of reaping what they had sown and Joseph's kindness to them was that yes, their consciences were awake more awakened. They felt guilt for what they had done, and they realized they were being punished for it now. We also learned a few things we weren't told back in chapter 37. Joseph was in distress when they threw him in the pit. He pleaded for his life, but the brothers would not listen. They feel that is why they are in distress now. <coughs> We're also reminded that Reuben was against killing Joseph. He convinced his brothers to throw him in a pit because he planned to come back and rescue him. But before he could, the others sold him to the caravan and going to Egypt. Reuben accused his brothers of not listening to him. And now they would have to give, give an accounting for his blood, meaning that more judgment was to come. We notice that this conversation amongst the brothers was overheard by Joseph. He had been using an interpreter to talk with his brothers, and of course he didn't need one, and his brothers didn't know that. After they admitted their sin against him and seen their remorse, Joseph is moved to tears. You know, we may have thought that when we heard this story that he was doing all this out of spite or for revenge. The proof that he was following God's will and plan is shown by his kindness to them and his display of grieving. He cared deeply for his family. He did not want them to starve to death. He wanted to see them live and not die. <coughs> God is leading Joseph in this testing of his brothers to see if their consciences can be awakened, reminding them of their sin, and ultimately in order to bring them to repentance. What God's all about. He wants overcomes. So Joseph gathers himself and he 
You take Simon away, he's behind lines and before their eyes. And this would make Joseph's threat really very real to them. Why did you choose Simeon? Now we aren't told for sure, but he may have chosen the second born after learning of Reuben's role and trying to save him from the rest of the brothers. Again, we see kindness shown to, to his brothers by Joseph. He gave orders for their sacks to be filled with grain, and the silver they brought to pay for it returned their sacks as well. He also made sure they had provisions for their journey back to Canaan. Joseph realized that the fame was not going to be over very soon. They're going to be money for the next time. So they loaded the garments and started coming. That brings us to our third point this morning. Consternation. Found in Genesis 42, 27, 38. I can't follow along with every those words. This is what God's word says. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sacks to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the sack. My silver has been returned, he said to the brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling. They said, what is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, the man who was lord over the land spoke harshly to us. They treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. <coughs> We are not spies. We were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father and king. And the man who was lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take food for your starving household and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, so I will know that you are not spies, but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you. And you can trade in the land. As they were emptying their sacks there, each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money, pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. <laughs> Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death, but I do not bring him back to you. And trust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. So when he stopped for the night, one of the brothers opens his sack to feed the donkeys, and he, and he finds the silver on top. Consternation, the feeling of anxiety, dread, and distress filled their hearts. They were distraught and paralyzed with fear. This appearance of silver would have reminded them of the pain they received from selling Joseph into slavery. <coughs> Notice they don't accuse the brother. We found the silver, but they realized that God's hand is in what's happening to them. They knew they were guilty and that God was punishing them. Realizing that God's hand was in this was another step toward repentance. But living with unconfessed sin and guilt calls them to react negatively to the kindness of shown to them. Maybe you can see this in your life. Something good happens, but you don't think you deserve it. Maybe you react negatively to it. We don't attribute kindness to God. We end up with just by chance. Maybe you even use the word karma to explain it. Or something good happens, but you don't give God the praise and glory for it. You forget about God's role in it. And you take it for granted. Now we need to repent of these attitudes and realize the work of God in our lives. And that brings us to the second next step, which is to realize the hand of God in my life and to give him praise and glory for it. Now the greatest act of kindness 
The greatest act of grace and mercy ever shown was when Jesus willingly went to the cross for every one of us. And today, if you're still rejecting that kindness today, if you're still focusing on the judgment, not on his love, grace, and mercy, maybe this third step is for you to accept Jesus' act of grace and mercy for me. Admit that I'm a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And confess that he is Lord. The brothers brought back in Canaan and report to their father all that has happened in Egypt. Again, this was another test for the brothers. God was tested to see if they would give an honor to report to their father. You know, last time when Joseph disappeared, they lied. Now they come back soon and he's disappeared. What will they do? They don't necessarily lie to their father, but they exaggerate the positives and leave out the negatives. They leave out that they were thrown in jail for three days. They mention the Lord over the land twice to convince Jacob to let Benjamin return with them. They related that that was how they would prove that they were not spies. The honest men who get Simeon back. They also added to Joseph's conditions. They told Jacob that they would be allowed to trade in the land because they realized that asking their father to allow Benjamin to go with them was going to be a hard sell, so they embellished a little bit. They were hoping that invoking the Lord of the land twice and the promise of trade with Egypt would loosen Jacob's grip on Benjamin. No one ever knew what Jacob was thinking, but he was going to allow Benjamin to go with them. But just as they were ending their sacks, each one found that his pouch of silver had been returned as well. And again, this kindness shown to them did not produce gratefulness, but fright. This kindness brought great consternation. The brother's sense of guilt and divine judgment was heightened. Jacob was also frightened and fell deeper into the depths of despair. He accuses them of depriving him of his children. Joseph's dead. Now Simeon is dead. But they want to take Benjamin away from him as well. Think about this. They have now returned home twice without a brother and with e extra silver in their pockets. For Jacob, this was not a coincidence. As I already said, Jacob knew what kind of men they were. He had a suspicion about what had happened to Joseph and now Simeon. And he dramatically states that everything is against him. You know, he can't see beyond his trouble. But he's only focused on himself and his losses in life. Not God. Next we see the guilt that Reuben must have been feeling. He asked Jacob to entrust Benjamin to his care. He will not let his father down. He tells his father that he may put his two sons to death if he doesn't bring Benjamin back to Egypt. Notice, Reuben doesn't offer only one of his sons' life for the life of Benjamin. He offers two of his sons' lives, one for Benjamin and one for Joseph. Reuben's guilt for what happened to Joseph was probably overwhelming him. One of them says, the brothers are trapped by their past lies and aroused consciences. How could Reuben say that yes, we lied and did away with Joseph, but no, we have, we have nothing to do with Simeon. Our hands are clean, our hearts are pure. So to demonstrate his sincerity, he offers to put to death two of his sons when Benjamin did not return. Now Jacob is still distraught. Under no circumstances will Benjamin go to Egypt. Jo Joseph, his brother, is dead. Listen to what he says. Benjamin is his only son left. Again, we see the favoritism that Jacob had for the children of Rachel, his preferred wife. Jacob finishes in dramatic fashion that if any harm comes to him, to Benjamin, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. But there is foreboding in his words. He will die dejected and not able to find rest in death. Where is the his commentator says this? Benjamin must be protected, even if the family starves and sitting in lots of jail. 
Today's, today's conclusion is from preaching today called the story called Guilt is a Warning. In the May 15, 1995 edition of the New Yorker, Sarah Mosley recounts that on March 18, 1937, a spark ignited a cloud of natural gas that had accumulated in the basement of a London, Texas school. The blast killed 293 people, most of the children. The explosion happened because the local school board wanted to cut heating costs. <coughs> natural gas, the byproduct of petroleum extraction, was siphoned from a neighboring oil company's pipeline to fuel the building's furnace free of charge. London never recovered from the blast that turned the phrase good town into a bit of a joke. The one positive effect of this disastrous event was government regulation requiring companies to add odorant to natural gas. The distinctive aroma is now so familiar that we often forget that natural gas is naturally odorless. There is a tendency these days to classify all feelings of guilt as hazardous to our self-esteem. But in reality, guilt can be valuable and odor of warnings is in danger. Joseph's brothers would testify God to awaken their consciences, remind them of their sin, in order to bring them to repentance. God was working in their hearts and minds. The guilt the brothers were feeling was an odorant, warning them and reminding them of their unconfessed sin and their need to repent. Same goes for us. The Holy Spirit within us will convict us of sin, and make our consciences to our guilt and sin. Sometimes God's test will be rude awakenings, but we need to confess that sin to the Lord so that he can cleanse us all in righteousness. That brings us to the fourth next step in the back of the communication card. Just allow God's testing to awaken my conscience, remind me of my sin, and bring me to the heavens. As the praise team comes forward and leads to the final song, and that the usher is prepared to pick up the communication card, let's go to the final song. Heavenly Father, help us to provide, to trust in you, to provide for us in our time of lack of need. Help us to realize your hand working in our lives and keep praising the Lord for it. And open our hearts to your Holy Spirit as he awakens our consciences, reminds us of our guilt and sin, and leads us to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen.